this up. Yeah. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And I will tell you about uh, some models that are very related to what uh, Peter has just uh, told about, except that the feedback uh, we will consider is a bit uh, different. So actually, my talk will be focused on the, um, to say the simple regret that is a quantity. Uh, the difference which is between simple and um, accumulated regret has already been uh, evoked uh, this morning, uh, this afternoon in, in the first talk. Uh, actually, I will come back to this. I will start by recalling a few results on, uh, on standard uh, regret on in bandit models. And then I will focus uh, more specifically on, on the questions that we have tried to work on uh, recently. Uh, at least you should uh, listen to the beginning of my talk, since I will be presenting a, a model that will be useful tomorrow in, uh, in, Robert's, uh, in Robert's talk. So at least you should listen to this. So <laughs> one slide. We can leave after that. Uh, and then you, you do as you want. <laughs> um, the model is, uh, is well known, but maybe not in this community. Actually, it's very close to what Peter was uh, talking about. Uh, here, you have uh, k options. Uh, the story, uh, I will tell, is a bit different, but it's kind of the same thing. You have k options among which you have to choose uh, sequentially. Uh, these sequences are 1, 2, uh, k. And uh, at each time you choose uh, option uh, number a, you observe a reward from the arm number A that is uh, drawn according to some probability distribution uh, nu sub A. And uh, you assume that what happens on the different uh, arms is independent. Or why, do, oh, why do I call it arms? It's because uh, this model uh, is famous as bandit model, which refers to the situation when you go to Las Vegas, say, or a casino, and you have the choice between maybe uh, um, a row of uh, bandit machines, of, uh, of uh, one arm bandit machines, and then, of course, you would like to focus on the ones that will give you the, 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 most, uh, uh, the more money, and so uh, you try each of them, and, well, you try to find the one which has the highest payoff. The problem is, of course, that uh, when you choose one arm, you observe only the payoff of that arm, and uh, the objective is, however, to focus as fast as possible on the arm that is, uh, that is the best. So uh, here we will assume that each uh, reward, each arm, is a probability distribution belonging to some family, parametric or not. If you're not um, uh, familiar with this model, you can just assume that this is a binary reward. If you choose some machine, either you win or you don't win. But, well, some other models have been... Um, Study two, and uh, what you can do is only choose your machine, the machine you will use, according to your past observations. That is, according to the arms you have chosen before and the rewards you have had on uh, these arms, uh, using these arms. Okay, so why uh, do people consider this model? It has had uh, quite a, a huge. Uh, impact in, in science for, for decades, actually. The, it, started, it all started in the 1940s with clinical trials, because you can uh, imagine that your different options are different drugs that you ca will uh, uh, give to some patients. And of course, you want to save as many patients as possible. So each time, say you are a doctor, each time a, a new patient enters your, your office, you give him one treatment, you observe. Either he dies or he doesn't die. And of course, uh, you want to save uh, as many people as possible. Uh, so this is why there has been quite a few works for, for a long time uh, on these kind of models. Uh, recently, uh, people are interested, especially uh, in uh, connection with recommend assistance, because it's a bit the same problem when you, you are a, a, a web provider and you have a an ad slot on the web page you can provide. And of course, you want uh, to provide each user with the ad that he will click on with the highest pro probability. So at the beginning, you don't know him. You try sport, you try news, you try the cars, I don't know, different kind of, uh, of um, ads that you, can, that you can provide him. And you hope to focus as fast as possible on the kind of ads that he will uh, like most. And there are other um, applications that we can discuss afterwards if you want. But uh, usually, in this model, people are 
more interested in accumulated regret. That's linked to the story I just told you about. The number of patients you, sur you save is just uh, ST, the sum of the rewards, when the rewards are, are Bernoulli. And uh, if you want to, to maximize the ST, so that amounts to maximizing the number of times you, uh, you give the, the best arm, the arm with highest uh, expected payoff, then this, of course, is equivalent to minimizing the regret uh, Peter was talking about. The regret is the difference between uh, what you would have done if you had known in hindsight which treatment was the best one and what you will uh, do with your treatment, uh, with your way of uh, trying the different treatments. So what you will do in expectations, this is, uh, this is called the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the accumulated regret. And so, well, this is the problem. There are lots of strategies that have been proposed to uh, minimize this regret. Some of uh, them are inspired by uh, what Peter was talking in the, about in the last uh, talk. But uh, another one, which has become quite famous, uh, is called the uh, upper confidence bound. So the bad idea would be, just as before, to focus only on the observed performance of each a treatment. If you just uh, rely on the estimate of the probability of surviving uh, giving a, a pill, that is the frequency of the survivance uh, among those patients for which you have attributed one treatment, then this leads to a very, very poor uh, strategy with a very, very high regret. You should not do this. You should bias your estimate. And actually, you, you should uh, give a positive bias to those uh, treatments that you have not attributed uh, much so far. So you inflate the estimated reward with an exploration bonus that takes this form. You can just remember that it's, uh, it's decreasing in the number of times that you, give, you, have, that you have attributed the, the treatment so far. So this is, there are lots of reasons to believe that uh, this strategy is uh, efficient. It has been studied in uh, different uh, uh, ways uh, so far. And maybe you will hear a little more about this if you come to Robert's no, uh, talk tomorrow morning. Uh, that's not what I want to focus on. Yeah? So if NAT is 0, that means you have not tried that R before, then it's infinity. Yeah, that's right. So each, at the beginning, you try each uh, option once just to initialize this. You can say the index is plus infinity in that case, and so it will uh, be prioritary uh, against uh, all the other arms. Yeah. Um, what I want uh, to, sh to say is, uh, well, uh, this strategy works well. You can try it. Uh, how well does it work? What can we say about the optimality in this problem? And the optimality properties in, uh, for accumulated regret in classical bandit models is very well known. Actually, we can say quite precisely how many times you will have to play each suboptimal arm. And this number is, roughly speaking, the log of t, the number of patients you will have to see in your life, divided by an information term that is uh, actually a kullback leibler divergence, or more precisely, an infimum over uh, kullback leibler divergences. And this bound uh, you can uh, obtain uh, by using changes of distribution. Behind all these kind of arguments, the idea is to say that, uh, well, you want a strategy that will work well whatever the bandit problem you consider. So for, to make it simple, just say that uh, you have Bernoulli rewards and you have two arms. So you can say that the parameter of the first arm is P1, the parameter of the second arm is P2, and uh, your, uh, you want whatever the pair P1, P2 that uh, you have to face. You want to take the decision. Uh, you want to attribute in this part of, this, uh, of the parameter space almost always the treatment number one. And in this part of the uh, parameter space, almost always the treatment number two. So the idea of these lower bounds is always the same. It's to say that, uh, well, the observations you make are in a way continuous with respect to these parameters. So. If you are just here at the border, or more precisely, just uh, here 
in the other uh, part, at the, on the other part of the border, then um, you would have to take almost always the other decision. You would have to attribute treatment number Q almost always. But as I said, the observations are continuous with respect to that. So the observations you will have for these parameters have a probability that is not zero under, uh, under this game. And you can compute the probability of observing exactly the same thing here and here and say that, uh, well, uh, this probability is not, probably not uh, overwhelming, but it's small, but not so small. And in that case, you will have to attribute treatment number two very often. So this gives a contribution to the expected regret under that value of the parameter. That is what you obtain in uh, the bound of Lyon Robbins uh, for the generalized by Bonetas and Kateakis. And uh, actually, this is the right lower bound, since you can find uh, algorithms that match it quite exactly. So to obtain uh, algorithms that match it with, with constant one, it uh, took a bit of, uh, of effort, but uh, there are strategies, upper confidence bound strategies, for which the confidence bonus is not uh, so trivial as in the plain UCB method. As you can see from this formula, the initial UCB algorithm uh, was derived from Hovding's formula. This is a way uh, this is a deviation inequality that is not very well suited to all cases. A uh, much better way to obtain confidence region is uh, using, uh, for instance, empirical likelihood. So what we showed is that using empirical likelihood-based confidence region, then you obtain methods, for you obtain strategies for which the regret, so the expected number of times you play a suboptimal arm, is exactly the, this formula is a bit frightening, but less frightening that way uh, is exactly what you want, the minimax term, plus some remainder terms that are for, of smaller of the of magnitude. So, so much for the accumulated regret. Uh, I don't want, there, there's a lot more to say. There are very interesting strategies, terms and sampling, lots of things to say. But what I wanted uh, to present today is a slightly different problem. The one what you want to consider best arm identification. That is the case where you don't care about the patients you have in your study. <laughs> you just want to be able to save the, the, the next patient, the future patient, which is very important, the president, <laughs> whoever you want. So you want to save this uh, additional guy with the highest uh, probability, just this one. And the other ones, you can use them just to try as, uh, as you want. <laughs> That is, this time, uh, for the presentation, we will only focus on a two-armed bandit model. You have two arms. Say, you can imagine that they are Bernoulli, if you want. One of them is better than the other in terms of expected uh, reward. And you want to know which one it is. So you have to define a strategy that is a sampling rule, as before. Each time, you have to choose a new action given the past observations that will lead you to a new observation. But this time, you also have to choose a stopping rule when you, have, you say, oh, I know which one I, I, could, uh, I could give. I don't need any more patient, uh, patients uh, to try. And then you have to choose a recommendation rule once you have stopped to say, choose treatment one or choose treatment B. So this kind of problem is called, sometimes called the A-B testing. A-B testing usually refers to uniform uh, trials, uh, sampling rules. That is, you, you try uh, as often the first and the second option. And uh, often in, uh, in, uh, often, yeah, in A-B testing, the time t, the, the, the number of trials t, is fixed in advance. Here, we shall not uh, consider this. Uh, what I will present is a joint work with Emily Kaufman and Olivier Capet. So Emily was a student of ours, uh, actually now on the job market. And uh, well, we wanted to uh, find the best way to address this problem, but there are two natural ways to two natural goals in this problem, and one is not more legitimate than the other. Actually, the first uh, these these uh, ways to assess the efficiency of the strategies are both considered in the literature. The first one is to say, you fix the number of trials of, uh, of trials you have to some deterministic value t, and then you want to take a decision 
with the probability to, to make an error as small as possible. So you have the possibility to choose which observations is very related to active learning. You, you, you have the possibility to choose which observation you make, but at the end you must be very, very good in designing the best arm. And the second, uh, the second way to assess the efficiency of an algorithm is called the fixed confidence setting. This time, you want to make an error with a probability guaranteed to be smaller than some parameters, say delta, and then you want to use as, may, as few patients as possible. So this time, you have really a, a stopping time here. You can say at one moment uh, that you stop, but then you must be sure to take the good decision with probability, say, uh, uh, larger than uh, 0.99. So, of course, there has been quite a lot of work on this uh, problem so far. Still, uh, we wanted to be able to compare these two settings. Um, as we, we started, uh, well, actually, just imagine now that you have uniform sampling. Then this problem, the fixed budget settings, amounts to a classical test between two, uh, two hypotheses like this, whereas the fixed confidence settings rather refers to a, sec uh, a, con uh, a, s a sequential test of, this, uh, of, uh, of these two hypotheses. And in the very special case where you know the two parameters, mu1 and mu2, you just don't know which arm is mu1 and mu which arm is mu2, then it's well known that uh, you will use fewer patients in the fixed confidence settings and in the fixed budget setting, which is quite uh, intuitive, uh, uh, in fact, because here uh, you can observe patients one after one and stop whenever you want. So if you want to stop with a, uh, to, to err, to make an error with a probability smaller than uh, some delta, you will, need, you will need fewer patients that if you want to assess the same probability of error, but you have to say in advance, the number of trials that you want to use. You can, there's really a bonus for sequentiality in this, uh, in this case when mu1 and mu2 are both known in advance. And we wanted to know if this is still the case for compound hypothesis, that is when you don't know mu1 and mu2 in advance. Can you remind us what uniform sampling means? Oh. This means just that you draw as many times the first and the second arms. So you don't use the weapon of the uh, of the uh, sampling rule, you just say when you want to stop. You, what you have to choose then is just a stopping uh, rule. So your decision is only a stopping decision. You just randomly pull arms one yeah. after the other? In, in the uniform sampling case, which is not the one we, we focused on specially, but in the uniform sampling case, yes, you, you, can, you just say when you want to stop. When you say, I've got enough, I can say this, uh, this, are, this treatment is much better than the other. Okay? And, well, and so, to be able to compare the two settings, we, uh, we wanted to, to define two complexity terms. So, from the literature, uh, usually the probability, this will be no surprise to anyone, the probability of error behaves as an exponential, exponential minus the number of trials, divided by some term here that depends on the problem. Uh, and this term is naturally uh, interpreted as the difficulty of the problem. So the complexity is defined to obtain this. You take the limb sup as t tends to infinity of, uh, my, of this uh, quantity. It's very reminiscent of, uh, 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 of a large deviation uh, uh, rate. Whereas uh, in the fixed confidence setting, the results usually state that the number of uh, trials you need is proportional to, uh, to log one over the uh, confidence you want times some terms that is a good candidate to be termed a complexity term, and this is why we define the complexity in the fixed confidence setting that way. And so we wanted to see, okay, we wanted to see if here again there is an ordering, a natural ordering between the two complexities that will indicate that uh, you need fewer patients in the fixed confidence or in the fixed uh, budget setting. And um, actually to to obtain results uh, that way, to identify those complexities, you need two things. Of course, you need lower bounds and you need upper bounds. So the lower bounds uh, are, uh, require some changes of variables uh, as in the accumulated regret case, and the upper bounds require uh, to you to be able to design strategies, algorithms, 
for which you obtain approximately this, uh, this efficiency. And in order to, well, I can present all the way uh, the, the results uh, in great detail, but what I wanted to show you is a, a technical tool that is very useful for the lower bounds. Actually, these lower bounds, uh, they uh, all rely also, like here, on changes of distribution. You can t you try uh, to identify a confusing situation for which uh, the most confusing situation for, for your problem. And uh, as in uh, standard statistics, these changes of variables in uh, lower bounds, in minimax lower bounds, are often hidden in the use of pin scales inequality, say. So here, the, the equivalent for the bandit setting of Pinker's inequality that we propose is uh, this inequality. From this inequality, you can recover easily Lyon Robbins and, or, uh, or uh, Bionetas and Kateakis lower bound for the cumulated regret, but it was also the tool that we used to obtain our uh, lower bounds in the case of best arm identification. And uh, it allowed us to prove uh, this kind of things. So, we allow a bounce on the uh, complexity term for the fixed budget setting. We obtain an, in, uh, an informational quantity that is actually some kind of Chernoff divergence. So in cumulated regret, as we had said, this is a Kullback uh, Leibler divergence is uh, up here. In the case of best arm identification, it's not the same uh, kullback leibler divergences that appear, but it's Chernoff information. So what is this? So here, if you display the, uh, say, say you are with uh, Bernoulli arms, and so you take the usual Bernoulli divergence, which is a P log P divided by Q plus uh, 1 minus p log 1 minus p divided by 1 minus q, and you plot the uh, first marginal, okay, p1, this is the same for p2. Then what is the information term that appears? You look at the point for which this, here you have p1, here you have p2. You look at this P star for which the two uh, diver uh, KL divergences uh, are equal, and this is uh, this here. So this is oh. uh, what we called K star of P1 and P2. And actually, the interesting phenomena is that uh, it's not the same. Chernoff information that appears in both settings. In what case, it's the first marginal that you must use in your definition, and in the second case, it's the second marginal. So in general, from the lower bounds that we obtain, the two quantities do not coincide. Uh, there's at least one case where they, are, they completely coincide. It's the case, okay, I finish. Uh, it's a case of uh, Gaussian variables, for which you have something that is symmetric. So in the case of uh, Gaussian variables, this function of uh, P1 and, and P2 is, uh, has a very simple expression, of course. And then you find that, uh, well, you can have the lower bounds, you can have the matching algorithms, and the two, uh, well, I directly skip to the conclusion, the two complexities coincide, and you have exactly the same uh, number of trials in both settings. But, and this will be uh, my last point, in the case of binary rewards, they do not coincide. Of course, there is not this uh, property of the variance is not the same everywhere. It has uh, large consequences. And in particular, contrary to what we thought initially, and contrary to the case of uh, two fixed hypotheses, here, the complexity of the fixed confidence setting appears to be larger than the complexity of the fixed budget setting. And uh, to identify them exactly is very hard, but uh, we have been proposing uh, some elements of, uh, of answer and some uh, conclusions that allow us to say that in this setting, uh, this complexity is, is larger than that of the fixed, complete, uh, of the fixed budget setting, which is, we found uh, a surprising and, and a bit remarkable result. Okay. So thank you for your attention. I think I use my time.
question, maybe we can take it. Yeah, so um, initially when you talked about uniform sampling, you said uh, that the way these two things relate is actually quite obvious. And then at the end you tell us, but in general it's the reverse. So isn't that somehow... No, what was... Uh what was remarkable is what was not that we used uniform sampling, it's also that the two uh, parameters were known, the two hypotheses were known, so mu1 and mu2 were, were known. When you don't know them, then uh, it's, it's, a, it's much more difficult. In particular, what you ask for the universal, um, for the university, universality of the two algorithms, is not quite symmetric, and actually this is uh, the trick. This is where uh, you are much more demanding on the fixed confidence universal algorithm than on this uh, fixed budget setting. You want a method that works whatever the parameters of the problem. So of course, when the uh, hypotheses are compound, this is much more demanding. Here, you just want, in the fixed budget setting, you will just want to impose that whatever uh, the, the problem, you finally take the wrong decision with a probability tending to zero. Whereas in the other case, you want whatever the problem, the probability of error, to be smaller than delta. So in a way, the, the, uh, the fact that this confidence appears in this term, of, is this, with this definition of a complexity to be, um, more, uh, to be larger in that case, comes from the fact that in this Uniformity hypothesis, you are much more demanding. Okay, uh, let's thank Aurelian again. Thank you. Thank you.